Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to give a couple more minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the X by 2 webinar, Navigating a Large Transformation Program, a checklist for PNC insurers. I want to thank you all from the X by 2 team for taking the time to join in the webinar today. We really appreciate that you were able to dial in and um, listen to what we have to say around the uh, large transformation programs and how to go around um, attempting that. So a few things before we start. Uh, number one, we do have a question feature on the webinar tool. If at any point during the presentation you have any questions for our panelists, I encourage you to write them down on that uh, question feature. We have set a 10 to 15 minutes on the webinar at the end to address all of those questions, but this way it is fresh uh, for you to write those down and then we can circle back and answer those. We also have four brochures available on the handout feature on the GoToWebinar tool. We have two around PNC insurance. One of them focus on our data strategy approach, the other one on our approach to PNC insurance in general. But we also have a health and life brochure too that will give you um, some idea of our breadth of work in other areas of insurance too. So I encourage everybody to download those. If after the webinar you want to contact us, we have an email set up. It is contact at xbyte2.com. I will put that email address at the end of the webinar. Um, if you have any comments, if you want to meet with us to go over some of the details that we discussed today, we would love to have that call or that meeting with you, so feel free to reach out to us. That contact at xbyte2.com email address is also on the brochure, so if you download those, you'll be able to see the, um, the address there. So a little bit about our company, who are we at XY2? We are an IT consulting firm that helps insurers develop forward-thinking strategies and agile processes to streamline operations and drive long-term success. We've helped insurers respond, not react, to changes disrupting the industry with data-driven initiatives. We have 20 years of experience in IT consulting 17 of those focus on the insurance space. We've helped more than 25 insurers in their journey. We have led seven core system modernizing projects in our time in uh, consulting. And we have an office in Detroit, Michigan, and one in Toronto. A little bit about our presenters today, Oleg Sadikov, our principal and senior architect and Christian Prasad, one of our senior program managers. They both have 25 years of experience each leading enterprise projects. Recently, they've been spearheading a core system modernization project for a Fortune 500 PNC insurer. This webinar combines their years of experience in the field and the recent learnings from that project. So right now, I'll pass it over to Krishna and he'll start the webinar, and then we'll hear from Oleg a little bit later. Thanks, Manny. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. Before we get started, uh, we wanted to set the context for what we are calling a large transformation program. Many of the points that you're going to hear over the next hour or so is in the context of these programs. So we wanted to make sure that we establish the context first. So the first one in any large transformation program is that it's going to modernize one of your core business areas um, in the insurance domain. For example, it could be your underwriting or claims or billing. More often than not, it's going to have impacts to more than one core area, but you would typically not want to do a transformation effort that spans across multiple core areas. Typically, it's going to be one of these core areas. The second characteristic of any large transformation program is just that it's highly complex. And what we mean by highly complex is a couple of different dimensions. For one, from a scope and size standpoint, it's going to be extremely large. It's almost always a multi-year effort. And in terms of just the integrations uh, challenges, uh, it's going to be very complex in terms of the number of trend integrations you have, uh, the complexity of them and many new ones that you'd have to create, integrate with new things and also exist with existing ones as well. So those integrations typically 
are a major uh, factor of complexity to these large transformation efforts. And the last but certainly not least is the fact that any transformation program that you're going to go through is going to have significant changes for the current end users, both internal and external, and both from how they interact with the systems that uh, they use today, and as well as uh, their standard day-to-day -day business processes and workflows. More often than not, these transformation programs are going to have significant changes in both aspects. So with that context, um, the first thing, what would you consider are the key elements for the overall approach, right? So from our experience, we have found that the first thing that you want to do is you want to establish the core objectives for this initiative. You want to establish them, validate them, document them, get them ingrained into every single team member's uh, minds uh, as much as possible. And the reason is because these large transformation efforts are typically multi-year efforts and people come in and out of the program and more often than not if you don't have these core anchors that you can go back to uh, and keep validating you often find that a program starts with certain set of objectives and within two three years it's morphed into something else or the second factor is over this journey at many different points, you're going to be making very hard prioritization calls, right? That is often enough, you're going to find yourself that there is no easy answer. You'll have to make a decision between two choices. And when that kind of priority decision is on you, it helps to weigh those priorities in the context of the core objectives that you have set. So those two are the key reasons that we find that we've got to establish them up front and use them as the main points as we go forward. The second element of the overall approach that we insist on is that you adopt a product mindset and not a project mindset. And what I mean by that is typically projects are in the context of, uh, you know, fairly straightforward, well-known, uh, bound set of requirements that takes a certain fixed amount of time, um, you know, typically short in nature, and you collect a group of, uh, you, you assemble a team from different groups, get the project executed, and then it, the team kind of dissolves or goes into maintenance mode and goes away. Well, any large transformation project is not going to operate in that mode. It's going to be a long-term effort. It's going to need for you to plan for the long-term uh, both from a roadmap standpoint, from an architecture standpoint, from a team organization standpoint. So it's more you have to plan for the long term and make sure that everything that you do is uh, in that context. And we'll talk more about roadmaps in the following slides, but in general, having a product mindset is good. And, and the follow on to having a product mindset is also you want to think like a startup. Now, that's interesting because most large transformation projects happen in large enterprises. And uh, for large enterprises to think like a startup is uh, often not uh, straightforward. But we have found that in order to be successful, you want your organ, your group should kind of operate in that mode. And what we mean by uh, act, uh, thinking like a startup is, you know, you, you are typically going to solve a complex problem and you don't want to... Um, you don't want to wait till everything is implemented before you show it to the users. You want to start doing some kind of a minimal viable product model. You want to adopt the iterative approach or the big bang approach. And the other thing about thinking like a startup is, again, since these are going to be multi-year projects, you want to start, you want to plan your project so you kind of skate to where the puck will be. Well, if it's going to take you three, four years to complete the effort, even if you do have these iterative uh, steps in between, by the time you complete the initiative, technology, the speed at which it's changing is going to be so different potentially that you don't want to be outdated as soon as you finish this initiative. So you want to kind of plan for the future. So those are the three uh, key points uh, that I w wanted to insist, uh, stress on. Again, going back to the product mindset approach, 
the difference between a product mindset approach and the project mindset approach is a project mindset approach typically assumes it's going to be for a short period of time you assemble a team and then it kind of uh, disassembles after the project is done whereas a product mindset tells you that this is for the long term you got to have a road map and and execute to that road map and you got to have you have to have a you have to build an organization almost to support that roadmap execution for the long term it's more the short term versus the long term approach and the last uh, item on the key element of the overall approach is to bring people along and in the earlier slide we had said that one of the characteristic of any large transformation project is that it's going to have significant changes to the end users and in in that tone it's very important that as we go along this transformation project we bring our end users along a uh, couple of uh, techniques that we have used to ensure that is to make sure that we communicate we communicate early clearly often and also we create easy early visible victories that we can share with our end users so they get they stay engaged in the in the process and in the program as it goes forward the next few slides is going to talk about roadmap and i'm going to turn this over to oleg thank you krishna hi everybody this is oleg um glad that you could join us today so well uh, let me talk a little bit about um, you know uh, roadmap and and uh, approach that uh, we take uh, right I mean to to elaborate and add to uh, what Krishna described uh, in the previous uh, slide so once again reiterating uh, we are very much big believers in in products not projects um, approach and uh, you know as any product any startup that works on a product right it starts with the you know some core ideas core objectives right uh, so people want to come up with a product but they don't know you know how uh, this particular uh, endeavor will uh, actually end and uh, by the time the product enters maturity some features that were envisioned in the beginning may not be there some features will change right but like the core understanding of the product will probably still be there but the concrete features will evolve right i mean it's very much adaptive approach so so like you know one interesting uh, way people think about that right is uh, uh there's a notion of a product box right envision yourself you know de delivering your product and it's in a box on a shelf right i mean what will be written on that box right i mean those are your core objectives that's where your you know uh, journey starts right i mean are you able to write down very succinctly a few bullet points describing what are you trying to accomplish right and that's your core objective objectives right i mean that's your product mindset but you know the important thing is it's great right but how do you get there right i mean and that's where the roadmap comes in right so the first sort of like point about the roadmap is don't go anywhere without one right it's a long and very complicated journey and in order to succeed on any journey of this scale you have to have a roadmap you know we we may have a uh, an objective to reach a mountain peak right but like it's one thing to uh, have our sights very high but another thing is to have a very kind of rational right and 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 drawn from experience you know way to get there right i mean key milestones to reach right and and and, and the appropriate trails to take right so that's what we're talking about the roadmap that we need to to go on the journey and i want to emphasize that a roadmap is not a project plan right so like you know obviously a lot of people had experience with more traditional ways of executing projects and you always have a plan right i mean all the tasks and everything uh you know uh, where we frankly pretend that we can predict things you know up front uh and 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 kind of like think that we know what will happen in the future which we don't right so the road map is not that right i mean the road map is a tool to support and facilitate agile execution 
you know, right? I mean, so instead of pretending, you know, that we know everything, we focus on key things and we give our journey the structure that we need, right? I mean, to be successful in executing that. And early stages of the roadmap itself is figuring out the roadmap, right? So we call, you know, some of these initial phases, right? I mean, that we go through inception phases, right? I mean, and those are, you know, you know, activities that we take to flesh out the roadmap, right? To understand, you know, what will our scope be? I mean, it's one thing to to write down core objectives, but there is always boundaries, scope boundaries that can be wider, can be more narrow, right? So, well, so where do you draw them, right? I mean, how do you go about delivering things? You know, what are your priorities, right? I mean, all of those things go into the uh, roadmap and 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 how to structure and and set up your execution. So roadmap is essentially is a structure of your journey, right? Structure that is given to the delivery, structure that is given to the team, right? Because like you know, one thing that we do in the roadmaps is we try to figure out what are the opportunities for parallel execution. Right? What are the dependencies between different parallel execution tracks? And that goes into structure of the team. Right? So obviously when we take on a very, very long and, and uh, sophisticated journey, we have a lot of work to do, so it will not be practical to do it as one large team. Right? So we uh, you know, almost like architect our execution, we break things down, we organize things to facilitate parallel execution and, 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 and tracks and dependencies. Another thing is roadmap is not static, right? It needs to be adapted con continuously as you go along, right? And it's an important communication tool. So another point, you know, that I wanted to make is when you start on a big journey to, to transform your enterprise, right? It's a little bit of like, don't go too narrow and don't go too broad, right? So, so it's, 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 it's one of those things when you need to get things just right, right? A lot of people try to look at things, frankly, a little more tactically, and sometimes it's the right point of view, right? I mean, but a lot of times it's, it's, it's um, uh, you know, a little bit too narrow, right? The, we, we hear a lot, hey, we just need to update our policy administration system. Right. But it's very rarely where business problems are just about policy administration. Right. There are like workflows and processes around that. There are interactions between policy administration with other systems. There are self-service capabilities around that. Right. I mean, so you need to be very careful to understand where the problems problems really lie and address them. That being said, there's another tendency that is as dangerous, right? I mean, is to go too broad, right? And and that is a very well-known, right? And boiling the ocean syndrome, right? I mean, let's try to change everything since we're changing things. And unfortunately, you know, it can really uh, create an impossible task, right? I mean, and not everything is critical to the business and some systems, uh, no matter how old, can still serve their purpose, and 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 some of these systems really hurt, you know, um, you know what insurers uh, must do in the current market, right? So it's, it's important to be judicious and and really understand where the business uh, value uh, really lie. Another thing about like you know, and I think that that echoes so what Krishna already mentioned, right? I mean, thinking like a startup also means that when you design your roadmap constantly thinking where the quick wins are going to be, right? I mean, and those are very important for a variety of reasons, right? Like, you know, you need to think about, you know, once again, right, we're all uh, scaling uh, the mountain, right? And then trying to go on a very complicated journey. We're all tired at times, right? I mean, we need to have something that lifts the spirits, right? We need to have and it needs to be embedded in our thinking as managers and leaders of of uh, large programs, right? I mean, to to think about wins that will, you know, uh, make sure that uh, the team feels good, right? I mean, that the business sees the value early, and that we get early feedback from from the users of uh, of the system, from the 
you know, what everybody, uh, you know, who have a stake in it, right? I mean, that we can, we can get early feedback. And once again, that is very much what startups do as well. And then, uh, you know, once again, business benefit, right? I mean, try to provide it as quickly as possible, right? So, um, you know, well, those are the important points, right? I mean, I wanted to make that, uh, you know, well, once again, roadmap is one of the most essential tools. It's very important to have, you know, um, a good one, right? I mean, that is put together with people uh, who have experience, uh, you know, in doing uh, these type of projects, right? I mean, programs, right? Because, like, you know, this is, you know, the navigation tool for the uh, journey. So uh, I wanted to talk about technology and process a little bit, um, uh, switching gears here. So one of the important topics that, you know, always comes back, uh, always uh, comes up rather when uh, we embark on uh, large transformations is the matter of new technologies, right? Uh, is it appropriate, right? I mean, to introduce new technologies, what, you know, how, how, how much of it, right? I mean, is appropriate where the risk lies, right? So we have a few, you know, um, uh, viewpoints on this that I wanted to uh, share because it's very common to have these conversations when, you know, uh, we deal with uh, large uh, programs. So first of all, right, and uh, once again, we're going to be a little bit like, uh, you know, intentionally self-contradicting uh, ourselves, right? I mean, so the first thing that I wanted to say is absolutely be bold and introduce new technologies, right? Uh, you know, very few um, opportunities of this magnitude, you know, happen in the large enterprises where, you know, enough attention and enough skilled resources are, are assembled together where you can really, you know, use that. And it's almost responsibility for these large programs to drive innovation in the enterprise and uh, being bold and introducing new technologies and an important responsibility you know, of course, where it makes sense, right? Of course, you need to think about, like, you know, that uh, uh, what looks like cutting edge could be very well mainstream by the time uh, the project goes live. I mean, I can give you an example when, uh, you know, as Manny mentioned, I mean, uh, well, you know, draw some examples from the uh, most recent uh, program that uh, we've been leading. Uh, right? When we started, right, single page application architectures, Frameworks like React, Redux felt like cutting edge technologies. I mean, by now, right? I mean, it's very much uh, feels like mainstream and we are very happy that we introduced that as one of the cornerstones of the solution that we're putting together because like, you know, it's already delivering uh, a lot of value, right? I mean, we've been considering and like, you know, we're starting uh, prototyping and that's my next point, right? Uh, to, you know, at the same time, be conservative and proof of concept, everything new you introduce. And for example, we are, you know, um, uh, finding use cases for such technologies as web sockets, right? And uh, we're absolutely interested in that. But being conservative and uh, building proof of concept to make sure that in the complex enterprise environment with various tools and security measures and various levels of indirections, right? I mean, that the technology that you envision that will be, um, you know, delivering value at the same time will be robust and stable and will uh, be able to deliver, you know, on the premise that you expect, right? Uh, so, and then, uh, oops. I'm sorry. Okay, so the final point that I wanted to make about new technologies, um, be considerate and prepare your organization for the new technologies, right? Some of these technologies are much broader in their reach, right? I mean, so for example, uh, once again, in the uh, program that we've been uh, part of, right, I mean, leading, um, we recommended uh, uh, Kafka as uh, one of the new technologies that, uh, you know, is uh, being successfully um, um, part of the new solution to uh, to uh, drive the solution more in the real time and uh, event driven direction, but of course, right? I mean, it's it means much more than just it's not a small library that is used for for the new solution. It's a much broader reach, 
and uh, we're working very closely with the enterprise architects and uh, and uh, uh, op operations of the uh, enterprise, right, uh, to to make sure that they're prepared uh, and know how to operate this technology in uh, production. If I can jump yeah, in, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we talk about early early wits and um, the need for early visible victories. I think one advantage with introducing new technologies is, uh, like as we have found in our recent one, even though your project may take some time to see, to get into production, you can serve as a source of innovation to the rest of the company, and, and there may be other groups within the company that can leverage the new technology that you have POC and actually use it for their production earlier than you can. Absolutely. So you can actually be a source of innovation to the rest of the company. Very good point. And I, as I said, I think that it's almost like, you know, it's a responsibility of large programs, right? I mean, this is, you know, inflection points and the points where, where, where these, you know, uh, lasting innovations happen in the technology landscape of the company. So another um, angle, another like you know perspective that I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, that is also related to technology process, right? Is uh, what I'm what I'm calling here asking key questions early. And once again, right, um, you know, um, it's our experience, kind of like having conversations and talking to people and then driving these large programs that. You know, very similar type of key questions, like you know, uh, always uh, come to the forefront uh, when uh, you know these programs are discussed. So I wanted to uh, quickly discuss uh, uh, some of them. Should we be customer centric, right? I think that this is you know a, a question that needs to be asked by uh, you know especially insurers, right? Because traditionally many insurance companies have been policy centric and many still are and uh, you know there are good reasons for that right uh, that's how systems been developed that's how uh, the business been uh, developed but at some point right i mean that um, depending on uh, how many lines the company uh, carries depending on how complicated the business is right i mean depending on how underwriting organization works you know, not being customer centric introduces many points of friction, right, and inefficiencies for the underwriting organizations. That's been our experience, specifically on the underwriting side, right? I mean, that's where probably the pain is most acute, right? I mean, not being able, especially for the large companies, not being able to very quickly see all the related, right, I mean, and I want to emphasize, we're not talking like simplistically, you know, only individual, right, I mean, A, individual B is the same individual, but we're talking about more complex relationship, right, I mean, as an individual, I have certain personal lines, and I'm also a small business owner, I carry some commercial lines, and I have a relative, right, I mean, that has other, right, I mean, so we, we're talking about more complex web of relationships, and related business that is associated with the cluster of companies, right? I mean, and individuals that are related to each other that gives underwriting, um, you know, key perspectives in terms of risk assessment. So I believe that this question should be asked early on any um, a large uh, modernization program. Another one that is very important to ask early is, you know, real-time and event-driven versus batch, right? So once again, many companies are making like, you know, uh, strides towards real-time. Many companies have lots of real-time capabilities and yet many insurers are still batch-oriented. And, you know, what is important to emphasize, this is not just a particular feature, right? I mean, this is not just to say, oh, we've been printing our decks in a batch manner and we're going to introduce, you know, a real-time printing. It's really like, you know, it's, it's very pervasive. The, the, the batch-oriented thinking in a large enterprise really, you know, reaches into many different systems, many different assumptions that people make and you know, it's been our experience that if you want to really strive to become 
you know, more real time and event driven, you need to ask this question very early and understand and invest in analysis to understand where, you know, are those, you know, key points that make the company uh, batch oriented and what needs to be changed and how, once again, to draw the roadmap to, to make that transition. Modern infrastructure, right? Uh, so, uh, so I think that uh, when you modernize and, and, and introduce a lot of different, you know, changes and new systems, it's probably the right place to start. And, you know, the, the answer to infrastructure question nowadays, it's all about cloud, right? So when I say cloud, right, I mean, and it, there are two choices. Some companies go to cloud, right? And, and that's their answer to the modern infrastructure. So, so this is by all means uh, a, a great answer, right? I mean, that by, once again needs to be asked and answered very early in the journey. Some other people, and uh, you know, uh, we have experience, like you know, with a company that uh, is conservative and doesn't uh, necessarily want to put their, you know, uh, infrastructure on the cloud yet. But the answer there is be like cloud, right? So we are investing in in uh, technologies like OpenShift that are based on Docker, Kubernetes. That is essentially what cloud is is and runs on, right? So like, you know, once again, this needs to be asked, you know, very early in the process because, you know, once you make a lot of progress, it's, it's never going to be a good time. And, but this is very, very important, right? I mean, to, for the success, you know, especially on the technology front. Do we ask our users to enter data we could be automatically getting? Right. So when you deliver new solutions, new breed of solutions, right, you want to be, you know, efficient and, uh, you know, invest in usability. And one uh, great, uh, you know, uh, source of, um, you know, inspiration for some of these, uh, you know, ideas is, you know, there are a lot of online agency and comparative raters that do an excellent job, frankly. Right. I mean, like, you know, being creative and asking very few questions that, you know, show the opportunities for getting the data, you know, from, you know, available sources. And it's a mindset, right? It's a key question that needs to be constantly on the radar from the very beginning. And you would be surprised how much can be done if you are constantly, and you know, uh, being uh, vigilant and asking that. And then finally, do we focus on the entire user journey, right? Like, you know, do we have, do, are we investing in beautiful rooms, but forgetting all doors and corridors that the users will be taking to get to these new renovated, you know, rooms, right? I mean, are we thinking about all the portals and securities and mobile support, right? I mean, and dashboards that the users interact with before they get to our new beautiful quoting process that we're investing so much in building or transactions uh, that we're investing in so much to uh, to build right so so entire user journey is a very important mindset and i think that it's one of the key questions that uh, needs to be um, a focus of of the group so i'm going to transition back to uh, to uh, krishna Thanks, so like so so far we have looked at uh, some of the aspects of the overall approach and uh, honed in on the technology and process aspects of uh, transformation in the next slides we are going to hone in on a couple of different aspects it's we don't have enough time to uh, dig into the details of everything but we thought a couple of important ones that uh, worth discussing uh, uh, we we'll see in the next few slides. The first one is organization. Uh, we talk about the notion of having a product approach versus the project approach. And in that context, instead of if you were to think of it as a project, you would assemble a team and the team would, uh, you know, basically last for the short duration of the project and move on. But in the product model, you're really building, a, you can think of it as a product development organization. And some of the important aspects for that organization that you would need is the first one is you need visionaries in the core group of leaders on the ground. Uh, what what I mean by that is 
often enough we find that when we have this large transformation effort, the vision is in the heads of a few people, typically executives, who are in the stakeholders meeting. They come up with this vision and they want the team to execute on it. But often enough we find that when when the team gets to actually executing these things, that vision is not necessarily uh, transferred to the individual folks on the ground, and it uh, translates lost message is lost in the translation, so to speak. So we think in order for this transformation effort to be successful, it's very critical that you have on the ground leaders, right? We are talking of like you know dev leads and BA leads and QA leads. Who share that high-level vision? Who share the vision and also can think in a visionary manner, so they can go to the new direction that you want. Having said that, on the flip side, we have also seen the mistake where we bring someone who doesn't have any of the organizational knowledge uh, to come in and chart out a new course, and they do something that just doesn't coexist or align with the organizational values and uh, ecosystem that's there. So it's, ideally it would be great if you can pick a few leaders who are in the existing organization who have the ability to be visionary thinkers and groom them and train them to be those people. The second point is when you build this organization, uh, any large transformation project is typically going to involve using new technologies, new processes, and one common mistake we have seen many people make is to assume that the current group of people you have would be able to learn, ramp up, and guide the others on the team with the new technologies and processes. Our recommendation would be um, to not to do that necessarily, but look at getting some in critical SME subject matter experts on these new technologies or processes from outside, have them serve as mentors to the team, even if only for a limited period of time, so that the ramp up time is not that high and you also learn it right the first time. And the third point around getting the organization ready for these large transformation efforts is that it's going to be a long effort and it's entirely possible that during the course of this long journey, we may have to make a few changes in the directions because the business is not going to sit still and there may be changes that you would have to make and adjust as we go along. And preparing the organization to be able to adapt to those changes is critical. And you can do a couple of things to prepare the organization for that. The first thing is to just establish that mindset to begin with, that you know we would have to be prepared for these changes. Having a clear roadmap with clear, easy victories and boundaries would be good because then after we have developed something uh, tangible, we can then have an option to change a little bit the course correct instead of trying to boil the ocean in one big thing and not being able to do anything of that sort. And finally, uh, having a proper architecture is critical so that uh, you have technical feasibility to do any kind of course uh, realignments as needed. So we talked about the dev organization. The equally critical is this set of strong and heavily involved stakeholders. Now we had talked initially that any large transformation is going to have large effects across the entire organization. So you want to make sure that in this stakeholder meet, in this stakeholder group, you have representation from all impacted groups. One of the challenges that we have often run into is typically in any of these programs, you have one or two groups that are that are more vocal than the other groups, for lack of a better word, and and kind of typically it works out that we we organically kind of mold the project to fit the needs of those one or two groups till. At a later point, the, the, the requirements or the needs of the other groups come to the foreground and then it becomes a sticky point. So to avoid all that confusion, it would be really good to have all groups represented right from the beginning so everybody knows uh, where we are along the way. It kind of goes back to bring people along with you. One other tip that we have found is when we give these regular updates to the stakeholder meeting, it's nice to give a PowerPoint presentation and people can think they absorb it, but we have found from our practice that giving working demos of the software definitely helps 
convey what we are where we are and what the status of the group of the project is for programmers much better than just uh, you know talking through it through a powerpoint and uh, we talk about it in the context of needing visionaries and leaders on the ground but uh, another point that again i want to stress is to ensure that the strategy and the priorities that the stakeholders agree on are truly cascaded down their respective organizations so that there is no gap in uh, translation so i think this is the last slide so this is the last as uh, point that we want to stress on around uh, the transformation programs which is change management you know you, you can do everything right you can have an absolutely wonderful product built but if users are not able to accept it it's not going to be of any use so even though this slide kind of comes in the end of the presentation this really makes or breaks your program really so change management is super critical and uh, it's not something that everybody recognizes that change management is important but a few things that we have found um that are critical to make change management successful that people often overlook are the first one is communicate 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 right i i think communication is something that people understand is uh, important for large programs but what people that people often falter is you know it's either sporadic sporadic uh, communication or communication to only certain groups or communication only in the case of good news things like that right whereas uh, our recommendation would be to ensure that communication all kinds of communication even good bad ugly everything goes to all parties on a periodic consistent manner so that there is nobody thinking they don't know what's happening the second point that on change management is to engage the end users even during the development process um we've often found that uh, typically you'd go through the development process because you think it you're not ready for the end users and then you complete the big piece of development and then turn it over to the end users only to find that while it worked great in your lab it doesn't really work as well in that environment so i think it's critical for these large programs because they are going to create such a big change in the way they do their day to day activities that you figure out a way to get them into the loop as you go along one of the things that we have done that we found to be very useful is as you build your roadmap building up the set of use cases functionalities even if as soon as you get done with one use case you take it to the user see how it works in their environment and come back with that uh, uh, feedback so that you can incorporate it as you go forward so it's almost like you know have a customer acceptance testing on a use case by use case basis and the last thing around change management is uh, you know starting the process earlier including the change management team right often the change management team comes in after most of the development is done they themselves don't understand the project the, the what the scope of the effort is and then they are really the front face of your program to the end users it really helps if you engage the team up front early and get them ingrained in the whole process so they can represent you better to the end users and i think that was the last slide i'm going to turn it over to nani now uh thank you both oleg and krishna for going through this checklist for us today um we have some time to answer some questions so feel free attendees to write them out on the question or the chat feature on the go to webinar tool uh we'll I'll read those and have uh one of our guys answer also in the meantime i wanted to remind you that we have four handouts that you could download in the tool uh two are around our PNC brochures one focus on our data strategy and one focus on PNC work in general but we also have a health and life brochure too um so you can see the scope of our experience in those other insurance spaces in the meantime while we wait for people to write those questions krishna i think one of the things that um some people might have some questions around is how to prioritize the work how do you manage it all and how do you decide what to do first if you want to uh give me your thoughts on on that area so we we talked about the technology road map right so part of uh, part of developing the technology road map involves the prioritization of what 
what you want to do. And that kind of falls under different dimensions. The first one is on along the business dimensions. So typically these large pro programs uh, deal with more than one, uh, in the case of insurance, one product line. So you want to take, you don't want to take the most difficult product line. And uh, at the same time, you don't want to take something that is uh, really insignificant. So you want to pick the product line that is going to give you the maximum bang for the buck. And given that it's a brand new platform that you're building out, you want to make sure that it's it's the right level of complexity. So from a business standpoint, I would prioritize the product line as such. From the technology standpoint, you know, we talked about introducing new architectures, new technologies. So you want to make sure that the framework is built properly. So I would prioritize building the framework first and then building the core business capabilities on top of that. Yep, that makes sense. Oleg, uh, kind of piggybacking on that, um, how do we organize that architecture work in the program? Like, how do we decide within the architecture work that needs to happen, and how do we address those? So, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, right? Uh, so I think that one thing that uh, is worth uh, discussing is how to organize architecture on a big, uh, uh, you know, uh, transformation uh, program and you know a very typical uh, question that uh, happens in the beginning is you know many organizations nowadays invest in architecture and uh, many have uh, you know their enterprise architects and uh, solution architects and uh, you know sophisticated architecture organizations in place and the question is always you know what is the relationship between the enterprise architects and the the these programs you know can the enterprise architecture group uh, fully satisfy the needs of the program in terms of architecture do we need to expand that right like you know well, what is the right approach so so like one uh, first point that i wanted to make is you know the 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 large transformation programs represent a significant expansion if you compare to the steady state of what enterprises go through right so so to me is you know you need you know to think about adding capabilities um to um to the um uh, you know uh, enterprise uh, architecture uh sort of like you know bandwidth that being said, it's absolutely necessary in my mind to find, you know, a few, one, two, three, whatever that number might be, of key, you know, enterprise architects that, you know, will come in and be a part of the large transformation program full time for the duration, right? I mean, these people, A, will bring the wealth of knowledge of you know what the uh, culture and like you know existing solution and the way of thinking about existing solution is today right i mean that will bridge that with the with the team on the ground that builds a solution because you want to bring build a solution that will you know organically you know become a part of the enterprise right i mean and those are the people who will you know, be key to make that happen. That being said, the architecture muscle of the large program needs to be uh, even, even, even larger, right? I mean, that's just a couple of people who come uh, from the enterprise architecture capability. And, and that's where, like, you know, piggybacking on what Krishna said, right? You bring those, you know, skills along, right? I mean, if you're doing a sophisticated UI development with new modern, you know, technologies in place, you need an architect that knows, been there, done that, right? I mean, you are building a new integration capability. You need an architect that knows exactly what you're doing, right? So, so basically, the message is like, you know, you need, you know, a, a good, skillful group of architects that day in, day out think about the, you know, this program. You need the bridge to the enterprise architecture team. You need constant communication, and you need, you know, you know, key capabilities on your team. Thank you, Oleg. Um, we have a few more minutes, so Krishna, we have a question for you specifically. Um, elaborating on the having leaders on the ground, the question is, 
What are a few strategies to use to give feedback to those leaders to make sure they understand your vision and direction? <laughs> um, so b b before we um, before we kind of dig into the strategies, I, I think uh, this is the hardest part. But but the the key is to find those people with the right mindset. And what I mean by that is people who are you know who have a good knowledge of the current organization, good knowledge of uh, the general technology business landscape and are open uh, open to new ideas open to feedback and uh, are you know are sharp um having said that i, I assuming that we have that uh, assuming we have a person with that kind of a mindset uh typically the strategy that i use is two things one um i tell them not just what to do but why right i i find that if i explain to someone why doing this particular strategy how it's going to help us why we need to do that that often carries a lot more weight than just telling them what to do so explaining the why the the, the logic the reasoning behind why we are doing a certain things is often very is critical but I also find that sometimes leaders, especially if uh, the, more, the more junior leaders, they may know the why, but they may not necessarily know the what. So it helps to also tell them the what. So doing the combination of the why along with the what uh, is very, very uh, useful. And the last point, I, the, the second point around that is to just uh, reiterate on, on the communication aspect of it. Uh, um, so if, if you have been doing something for a long time, it kind of becomes second nature to you. But if someone is getting it for the first time, it often you may think that they may they may get it, but more likely sometimes it's possible that they may not get it. So just reiteration at the at the cost of sounding like a scratched record, uh, reiterating those points, the whys and the whats, uh, often helps in getting the message across. Thank you, Krishna. And the last question here for the webinar today is um, how much of a transformation initiative do you see as a change in business model or operating model versus uh, modernization of the technology? Um, I mean, it's all of the above, right? I mean, that's a short answer, and I will elaborate a little bit. Um, um, you know, the successful transformation starts from, you know, as we discussed, right, I mean, from having a vision, right? And, and that vision is critical to move the business to the new era, right? So that's, that's really what transformation is all about. Can we do the, the business in a new, you know, way, right? I mean, we, we, we all talk about digital transformation and like, you know, taking cue of how, where the world is, is going today with technology. And, and, and that goes much deeper than uh, just the updating technology. I mean, you know, deep uh, um, transformation leads to new business processes, right? I mean, we talk about customer centricity. That leads to completely new, I mean, we are introducing a completely new, um, you know, business processes uh, around data governance and uh, data stewardship. And uh, that has never been part of the, um, you know, picture. And it's, it, these are new business processes, new technologies, new operational procedures. Uh, we're talking about introducing uh, new uh, infrastructure and new uh, key technologies. This is all cutting much deeper and uh, it uh, basically leads to new operational procedures and, and new ways of uh, thinking. And uh, we're talking about like state, uh, straight through processing that, you know, is enabled by technology, but is completely different way of organizing business process and organizing business resources and uh, so, so that's why coming back to the uh, question, it's all of the above. I mean, I, I, I really, you know, very rarely when you see uh, the uh, large program that is just about the technology, it really cuts much deeper than that. Thank you, Oleg. I want to thank again, uh, Christian and Oleg, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge around um, the transformation of core systems. For everybody that dialed in and took the time, I really appreciate you joining today. 
Uh, we'll reach out with a link to the recording of this webinar uh, in case you want to listen to it again or share it with your team. Also, um, feel free to contact us at contact at xby2.com. We love to share this with your team and we can tailor our experience and our case studies and everything else that we have to the things that you're tackling at your organization. We would love to come in and share some of the knowledge that we have and see how we could help you with your digital transformation. Again, thank you and have a good afternoon. Thanks everybody.